So next, I would like to call uh, Dr. Jayasri. Uh, so good morning once again. So I'll be making this presentation on behalf of Dr. Shibashish Day. So this is going to be an extempo presentation for me also. So I hope you excuse me for this. So I'll be basically speaking on Epiphora evaluation and case selection confidence scheme. So, excuse me, it's not moving. Okay. So Epiphora, as we are all aware, is the excessive watering of the eyes that is caused either for your by your increased secretion or there is the poor drainage. So basically there is an imbalance that is being caused between the production and the drainage and this leads to increased watering from the eyes. So when the production is more, it is the secretory component that is the secretory epiphora and when it is due to the obstruction in the drainage, you have your excretory epiphora. So we have a long list of causes of epiphora and most important are the punctal causes which is responsible for almost 35% of the cases where you have the punctal stenosis and you have the punctal ectropion and then you have the tend to have the canalicular stenosis and other causes in the canaliculus and the entire anatomy which we are discussing about there can be obstruction at any of these levels. So it, this also includes the pseudo epiphora which we get in dry eye syndrome and the ocular inflammations and some si nasal and sinus diseases like polyps and nasal tumors may also be associated with the same including the aberrant nerve regeneration. So how do we get our, uh, get started with the, how do we deal with this patients first? So first and the most important thing is your definitely your history taking. We have to know about as with any disease process, we have to know that who, what, and where is responsible for your problem. So the very mild tearing is, is likely to be a complete NLDO, whereas the constant tearing down the face probably is. So asthenopia has to be ruled out. You know, sometimes the patients tend to come and complain to you that they have watering, but always it's not due to obstruction. So you have to rule out this. Swelling or pain in the eyelid or the medial canthus, however, points to an NLDO or the cryocystitis. And you also have to ask for history of any, uh, any sinus diseases or any injury. So the next is a guided examination. And so after history taking, we have to go about with a thorough examination that starts from your slit lamp examination itself. And before actually reaching to the lacrimal area, you have to also look out in the peri or vital region, in the periocular region, that is an important aspect. You have to look for the condition of the skin of the eyelid, the eyelid position, the blink rate. You have to look for the facial and periorbital asymmetry if there is any and any inflammation or discharge or fistulas should also be looked for. So the lower eyelids, you have to examine it thoroughly. In most of the cases, you'll find the people, they have the aged people, they have the lead laxity. There may be the punctal position with the globe and the medial canthus fullness. And we have to, we are all aware of the rope list is. So these are the examinations that we need to perform. And, uh, and also evaluating the tear meniscus and the decreased tear leg points to dry eye, whereas increased tear leg is probably due to your outflow problem. The next comes the test. We basically have the two sets of tests, the secretory test and the excretory test. In the secretory test, we have the examination of the tear film on the cornea and the tear film breakup time and the shimmers test. And in the excretory test, we have the fluorescent dye disappearance test, the Jonas test one or two, the probing, natural endoscopy, and including the higher ends like the decryocystography, decryocystography, CT, MRI, and so forth. So basically we need to first isolate what is the cause of epiphora so which requires your history taking a thorough clinical examination and a clinical test. Then isolate the cases with pathology which is present only in the lacrimal drainage apparatus. So we are dealing with only the cases which have pathology in this area and isolate the precise anatomical location where exactly your level of obstruction is. This is the most important part before it's not that we just randomly go for this year in all the cases. So you need to follow this protocol when you get a patient with epiphora. 
So Jonas test, di Jones dye test one and two, we have the Jones test one, which is performed by instilling fluorescent in the conjunctival phonics and then passing a cotton tip into the inferior matrix or a valve or fastener and you usually get the results in two to five minutes after instilling the fluorescent. In Jones test two, that is performed if your Jones one is unsuccessful. So here the residual fluorescent is flushed from the conjunctival sac and the cotton tip is used to test the fluorescent that it retrieved from the inferior meters. So Ropeless test which we all perform, this is the easy and just an outpatient procedure, non-invasive and an effective clinical test. And it is used for diagnosis of nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It is a highly sensitive as well as a specific test for di diagnosing NLDOs. A positive, if you get a positive ropeless test where you, on pressure you get the pus coming out, it is an indicator of the NLDO's presence. So the next is the syringing which we have all, all familiar with and it is one of the most important tests for evaluation of our lacrimal system. It is minimally invasive because again you have an OPD procedure that can be easily performed and does not require much of your sophisticated instruments. And it provides information on both, that is it confirms the pres presence of any obstruction if it's there in the lacrimal drainage system as well as where exactly your block is present. So it helps in both. So we anesthetize, the, we are aware with how to do the syringing, just anesthetize, then dilate the lower punctum and pull the eyelid laterally and then insert the cannula and then you inject the normal saline. So the potential sites of obstruction are basically which we encounter are the upper canaliculus block, the lower canaliculus block, then we have a block at the common canaliculus and also in the nasolacrimal duct. Now suppose it's a lower canalicular block, now we are doing the syringing from the uh, lower punctum. So what will we get if it's a lower canalicular block, if we are doing from the lower punctum, so it will regurgitate, it will come out through the same punctum. But if we do it now with the through the upper punctum, what happens since the upper canaliculus is patent, so you'll have the fluid, patient will come, say that yes, I'm getting the fluid inside, I can feel the sensation of the fluid coming in. So if it is at the, this is for the lower canaliculus. Now suppose the obstruction is at the level of the common canaliculus. Then here what will happen if we are injecting the fluid through the lower canaliculus, it will come out through the upper and vice versa because this tract is open and the tract down the sac and the and, uh, nasolacrimal duct is not open. So this is the case. But what if it is at the junction of the sac and your uh, nasolacrimal duct? So in that case, you know, because of this blockage, you need tend to have this mucopleurolent uh, things that gets accumulated in the sac. So here, it will not come out through the, it might come out through the opposite punctum. It will come out through the opposite punctum, sorry, but it will not go down your nose, okay? So the patient will not feel it. And in the first case, when it was a block in the common canaliculus, what we got was clear fluid coming out. But in case of the, uh, this nasolacrimal duct obstruction, you'll get a mucopurulent reflux. Okay, because in the first case is what we are injecting it's coming out and in the second case what we had inside the sac is what's coming out. So next comes the lacrimal probing. So I had already mentioned the initial part of my probing in the anatomical portion. So basically you have two stops, you have a hard stop and a soft, a soft stop, which is done to differentiate between your common canalicular obstruction and the nasolacrimal duct obstruction. When you have a, a common canaliculus obstruction, then because of the obstruction that is present, you'll get a soft stop. But when you have an NLD obstruction, so when you go inside with a probe, no, you'll directly hit the bone. That means you're going to get a hard stop over there. So in the NLD obstruction, you'll get a hard stop. In a common canalicular obstruction, you'll get a soft stop. So these are the various radiological tests that comes handy sometimes in diagnosing the cases. So you have the decryosystography, decryosintigraphy and the CT. 
So this is the entire scheme of evaluation when we get a patient with nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So if there is no resuscitation on the sex syringing, then well and good, the patient is normal. You have to rule out the other causes that are responsible for watering. If there is regurgitation through the opposite punctum, as I told you, if you get clear fluid, that means it's a common canalicular block. In that case, you need to go for a conjunctivo DCR. But if it is a mucopurulent, as already discussed, then external DCR is your option. And if there is regurgitation through the same punctum, that means it's the block is at the level of the canaliculus. This is just a summary of what we have already discussed. So we need to go in such cases of canalicular block, it's the canalicular reconstruction that is required. And you have the cases where there may be partial block. So when not to do external DCR, this has also been discussed in my previous, this, uh, in the previous, by the previous speakers. So in cases where you have the acute inflammation, patients who have uncontrolled bleeding dysrhesis, because you know DCR is associated a, with a little bit more amount of bleeding as compared to the other interior segment surgeries that we perform. So atrophic rhinitis, when you have the lacrimal sac tumor, you, and you have an uncorrected de uh, deviated nasal septum that has now been debated uh, a few minutes back. So uh, tuberculosis of the lacrimal sac, atrophic fibrous lacrimal sac, where we prefer doing a DCT instead. And in young patient, endoscopic DCR is preferred because of the uh, cosmosis unless it is contraindicated. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Jayasri. It's a very important topic, actually, the evaluation of the patient. You know? So you before going to what type of DCR you want to do, you want to do an external DCR or a canalicular DCR or a conjunctivo DCR. So evaluation is very, very important with the probe. It's a hard stop or a soft stop. If it's a hard stop, then you have to go for it's a nasolacrimal dark obstructions. And if your regurgitation test is positive, then you no, no need to think about it. It's definitely an external DCR. So this evaluation is very, very important. And also the tear film leg, if it is the tear film uh, is more than it, it may be an obstruction, or if it is less, the size of the meniscus. So if height of the meniscus, sorry. So if it is uh, low, uh, then it may be a dry eye. So the evaluation part is very, very important. So if it is a, if clear fluid is coming out from the upper punctum, so it's something is obstruction in the common canalicular region. And if there is pus coming out from the upper punctum, definitely the obstruction can be in the nasolacrimal dark obstruction, uh, NLD area. So that evaluation is very, very important for the PGs and all. And also uh, the where not to do the DCRs in active inflammation and if there is any blood bleeding problems and all. Thank you so much.